time to crack the code and unveil the neuromarketer's secrets. This is part three of our four-part special. And today we are discussing whether tech is changing our brains. Could the use of all the devices that we reach for every day not only be changing our lives, but changing our brains, the way we feel, the way we think, the way even we recall? Who knows? Professor Gemma Calvert is Professor of Marketing at the Division of Marketing at Nanyang Business School. She is also co-founder of Split Second Research. She's an expert in neuromarketing and over the past couple of weeks has been talking about implicit technology and the market research and the actual case studies that companies are using in this field. So if technology is changing us at a very fundamental level, changing our brains, the way we react to the world, our sense of rewards, why should this matter to brands? Well, Brands are studying how and if we're addicted to our phones and how they can leverage what they know about that uh, irresistible attraction and transfer that same attention to their brands, their products, even their websites. So we're looking under the hood, so to speak. Some say, of course, that our gadgets and computers are making us smarter. Others say they're making us violent and incapable of deep thought. So just how is technology changing or rewiring our brains and what does this mean for brand owners? First, up time to welcome professor Gemma calvert Prof, let's start with something we do every day browsing the internet it seems so innocuous seemingly all pervasive that browsing but is it affecting us from a neuromarketer's perspective well i think the fact that the average user now spends about six hours a day browsing the internet and or using internet-based services now that's nearly what a third of our waking life it would be unsurprising if uh, there weren't some changes happening in terms of the way our brains are wired and in fact that's what we're seeing in terms of sort of outsourcing uh, memory to search engines as you may have heard in the mainstream media. So it turns out and perhaps unsurprisingly that if you um, examine people who are um, allowed to uh, actually what happens is an experiment where they were asked to type in a whole range of trivia facts into a computer. And the first group were told that uh, the information would be retained and they could access it later. Okay. The second group were told that the information would be erased fairly soon. But interestingly, both of them were told that some of the facts, they would, could you please try really, really hard to remember them? And the others, they didn't say anything about. Now, irrespective of that... And what they found was those who thought that the information would be later accessible, even though they were probably expecting a memory test, um, still performed more poorly on all the measures of recall compared to the group who thought the information was going to uh, uh, be erased quickly. Now, um, this study has been replicated quite a few times. And in fact, the issue about memory and the effect of um, internet browsing on memory is probably the most pervasive or the most robust finding. Mm-hmm. And it turns out, this is, this is what's turned into, uh, I don't know if you've heard of the Google effect or uh, digital amnesia, the fact that, you know, we have become cognitive misers, we're lazy. <laughs> and the fact, well, why not? You can use um, other devices to store information, then why not? I mean, let's, these supercomputers are going to have a much greater RAM than we can ever have. And it's not all bad news, though, because... Oh. Um, we have become more efficient at navigation and search, so we know where to find the information. Um, we just might not remember it as well as we had before. So is it true, Professor, if you don't use it, you lose it? it you know, almost as if... Well, if you don't encode it, it isn't going to be in there, is it? In, in, your, in your brains, if you don't tell yourself that this is something that's important for you to remember, or even subconsciously because you think something else is going to remember it for you, you just don't, you just don't make well, the effort. Yeah, and it gets worse than that. So there was a study um, using smartphones mm. where um, a group of uh, participants were asked to go around a museum. Yeah. And they were told to explicitly take photos from the um, digital cameras okay. um, of certain objects and for other ones just to look at them and in- to encode them deeply. And again, the following day, they did a recall test. And counterintuitively, perhaps, um, the objects that they recalled the least were the ones that they had photographed. Again, it's as if, you know, you you think when we take photos, we really pay attention. But the reality is, we have somehow implicitly assumed that that information is going to be stored, thankfully, so we don't have to recall it, by a digital device. 
That is fascinating and that explains why I don't take photos when I'm on holiday. Let's move to the mobile phone that everybody has, a ubiquitous mobile phone. Now, I like to blame it for the fact that I now need reading glasses. But could our phones really be changing us at a fundamental level? So that's a really big question and it seems that the research to date, um, while still early in in its infancy, infancy, um, is showing that, yes, um, our reliance on smartphones is changing the way we allocate attentional resources. Um, It's changing the way, obviously, we encode and recall information. It's also having an impact on, uh, I guess, our mood, our sleep. Um, We're seeing uh, aspects of separation anxiety yep. if, if you know I mean we all need that phone and if I take it away from you for 12 hours you will see that uh, you know you start to become sort of anxious and in fact around 70% of people experience severe anxiety if uh, their phones are rem- are lost so is in, is the phone addiction real yes it is what you're seeing in brain imaging studies is that when you hear these Facebook likes they're the alerts yeah um, Activation is happening in the brain's reward centers, the nucleus accumbens, which is rich with dopamine, the brain's feel-good chemical. And that's being released every time you get one of those messenger alerts or a Facebook alert or an Instagram alert. Now, it's unprecedented in human history that we've had this level of dopaminergic expression, uh, short bursts of it all the way through the day. And, of course, this will have implications for how brands try and engage with us because we're used to having what we want, when we want it, and very often. So brands are going to be able to sort of um, prime our reward system or or work off the way our reward systems are being primed? Uh, If they're clever enough, I think that it's a challenge for them. To be honest, I think most, most brands are struggling to understand really? how to navigate this new digital environment, both online and offline, and understand consumers' needs in the digital space. And I think it's difficult because consumers themselves can't introspect to explain how they behave. But what we're seeing is that uh, you know, smartphone apps have set the bar so high in terms of rewarding fun stimuli mm. that marketers are turning to loyalty programs, to giving away free content, anything that's fun engaging, exciting, and in small bursts is probably going to be the way forward. It's not enough to just sell stuff to them these days. It's got to be thinking about how do we uh, meet their needs, not what the technology can do, and making sure when they're ready to buy online, ready to provide it. Absolutely fascinating. It was 10 years ago when tech writer Nicholas Carr published an article in The Atlantic entitled, Is Google Making Us Stupid? He strongly suspected that the answer was yes. He himself was less and less able to focus or remember things or absorb more than a few pages of text. And he accused the internet of radically changing people's brains. But technology has its defenders. People saying tech makes us smarter and that the skills of the future workforce really depend on an ability to multitask. So, Today we're asking, is tech changing our brains or is it just changing our cognitive performance, the way we react to tasks? Professor Gemma Calvert is Professor of Marketing at the Nanyang Business School and co-founder of Split Second Research. Let's tackle this area of concentration. A lot of people saying that because of the internet, people are less able to concentrate deeply and therefore penetrate real beefy ideas. Uh, I find myself watching TV with a laptop on my lap, switching between screens as if one screen isn't enough, you know. Uh, So is media multitasking affecting our attention? Yeah, I think there's quite a lot of evidence that that actually is the case uh, from from numerous academic studies. And it's not just the um, internal need to keep checking Facebook and so forth, um, but we also get distracted or interrupted. Um, by the sound or buzz alerts. And even if you don't react to them, um, studies have shown that you perform more poorly uh, the greater the user you are. Um, So even if you have a smartphone left on a desk, and it's not yours, uh, it's been shown that that will affect your performance negatively. Is multitasking a myth then? Of course, we know that because we are becoming, with smartphones, used to zipping from one app to the other. But you're saying it definitely decreases our performance when we do that? That's what the data show, yeah. And the thing is, those people who use, who have highest rates of smartphone usage and app usage Mm. across multiple platforms um, are less able to filter out distracting environmental stimuli 
uh, which it, irrespective of what that is. So not, not simply um, from digital devices. Okay, so purveyors of fake news really take advantage of the human inclination to want to believe what we want to believe. Tell us, Professor, do you think marketeers are shaping campaigns in line with what we know about how people uh, retain attention or how they recall or the way we perceive rewards? Well, I think that worldwide, as I said, I think marketers are struggling to catch up with this data because it's new. Um, Obviously, some of this is observational and you can understand that we have a limited uh, attention span these days um, and therefore brand owners and marketers need to communicate with us repeatedly but in small doses Mm. Um, and also make it you know rewarding you know what's in it for me why should I pay attention to your brand do you know how cluttered that environment is out there you know I, I, I think we're all as consumers overwhelmed by the sheer amount of stimuli the amount of options the amount of disruptive devices apps companies, services, and we're trying to make sense of this as well. Absolutely. So with so much distraction everywhere, is there a possible inoculation effect that training in self-control or critical thinking or training in concentration can have? So I'm talking about sort of balancing the distraction all around us. Mm -hmm. Do you think that if we had programs that really specialize in getting people to enhance their, you know, self-control and critical thinking would help? Uh, I think it's a possibility, but the jury is still out on this. So the early days of brain brain training um, apps and so forth really only showed that people got better at doing the task, but it didn't generalize to increasing their general IQ, something like that. Um, However, I think that maybe these days some of the um, approaches have become a little bit more sophisticated. Mm. Um, but they're still ready for um, trial and so forth. So we'll 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 need to see. <coughs> Apologies. What we do see is certain video games uh, do have the ability to um, improve certain areas of cognitive performance. Mm. But it turns out these come down to very specific games. These are action video games, first person shooters, which demand you accessing multiple cognitive resources, search, uh, dual attention across, uh, you know, different so Those could actually have positive benefits. Yes, it turns out that they do Im- improve your pattern recognition. Um, but that doesn't extend to games necessarily on uh, the smartphones, which are popular like Candy Crush or Words for Friends. So it's very seemingly specific to those kind of shoot em up games. Oh my goodness. Okay, does any of this help us understand why people religiously buy iPhones despite rising prices, Professor? Why some things just seem irresistible? Well, I think that's a very specific question about that particular brand. Um, so, obviously, it's linked into social signaling mm. and the fact that that's, uh, you know, it's a quality item, uh, premium with a very nice design. You know, I guess if you know, you think it's the best of the best, then it's something which people want to have to demonstrate where they are on the social hierarchy, I suppose. Terrific. Next week, we look at the future of neuromarketing. But for now, it's time to say thank you to Professor Gemma Calvert, Professor of Marketing at Nanyang Business School, co-founder of Split Second Research. We've been talking about whether or not tech is changing our brains. You've been listening to Crack the Code, Neuromarketing Secrets Revealed. Money FM 89.3